Thank you for joining us for this workshop on policy prescriptions to expand education opportunities in a post-COVID-19 world. Today's panel will be led by Robert Enlow, President and CEO of EdChoice, Bill Maddox, Director of the J. Stanley Marshall Center for Educational Options at the James Madison Institute, Senator Patricia Rucker of the West Virginia State Senate and Chair of the West Virginia Education Committee, and Freddie Wood. The Wood family is a hybrid schooling family, a hybrid schooling family that homeschools their children four days a week and places them one day a week in a brick and mortar school. They have a great story to tell about the value of school choice. And I hear some of the other Wood family members will be making an appearance. These policy experts and education reformers will be discussing how the visual, digital, private, and homeschooling communities have responded to the global pandemic and what policies should be addressed in the post COVID world to expand schooling options for families of all backgrounds. Mm -hmm kick off the session, I'd like to walk through a few quick housekeeping tips before the panel begins. If you'd like to ask any of the panelists questions during their presentation, you'll be able to submit questions via the chat box or Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We'll get to all questions at the end of the presentation. The chat box will also be used to distribute some great handouts, resources, and polling information from EdChoice. If you're interested in re-watching this workshop later, please note that we'll be distributing this workshop throughout Connect later on, and we'll be releasing it on our YouTube channel. We can also send you the video when it's released. Now to kick off the panel, we'll be having Bill Maddox from the James Madison Institute give some brief opening remarks. So thank you, James. I'm excited to be here as I know our other panelists are as well. Uh, as James mentioned, my name is Bill Maddox. I head uh, the Marshall Center for Education Options at the James Madison Institute. We're a state-based think tank in Florida. And I have the privileges of serving on the ALEC Education Task Force as well. Today's conversation is going to bring together a policy maker, a policy expert, and a parent to help us better understand what's taking place around us uh, in the midst of this pandemic, and then um, what can come out of this that might uh, be good for uh, families with children. And to kick things off, I want to turn to our policymaker, uh, Senator Rucker from West Virginia, and and just ask this initial introductory question, which is, how should policymakers think about this crisis? Um, should the goal that policymakers have be one of, let's just return to normal, whatever that is, as soon as possible, let's go back to where we once were as quickly as we can, or should, there, should the attitude instead be, um, let's use this crisis to address some underlying problems in K through 12 education, so that we end up with something better. Thank you so much, Bill, um, for that. And I have to tell you that that is a, the key question, I think, when we're talking about education now moving forward. Um, obviously, this vi virus is not going to go away. We are in a situation where everyone is concerned about their health and safety. And as legislators, you know, we have. Uh, two choices before us, as I can see it. We have the choice of trying to shore up the system and come up with ways to somehow keep kids safe using the traditional schooling method and involving a lot of money, um, any way you look at it. Or you have a choice of taking this as an opportunity to evaluate the way that we've been doing traditional schooling and seeing if there's ways that we can do things better, more um, innovative solutions and options for addressing the educational needs of the kids, um, and how do we facilitate that? So those are the two viewpoints I think you have to choose. Do you want to shore up the old system? You want to find better ways of doing things in the future. And once you choose which path, that guides you in your decision making onward. And I trust you would say that um, if we go forward in a manner that uh, addresses underlying problems in the existing system, that doesn't mean that we're going to leave behind folks who are satisfied with their current arrangement or what they've had in the past, but just simply that we're now going to expand the array of options that might be available to parents who perceive that they want or need something better. Is that fair? That is absolutely fair. I don't think, I don't see where we're going to move away from traditional public schools. That is something that is going to exist. But what are the best ways to provide that education? And how do we give parents the choice to make a determination of what is the best way to address their kids' needs, particular concerns if you have a vulnerable, you know, a child that has 
issues with, um, you know, vulnerability to the virus and things like that. So no, it is working with and expanding choices. Excellent. All right. That provides a perfect uh, a foundation for our discussion and a, and a perfect segue to our next presentation, which will come from Robert Inlow, our policy expert. Um, Robert heads the um, organization Ed Choice, and they have been doing some polling in the field since the pandemic hit to assess parents' attitudes, what parents are thinking, and then um, advising policymakers based on that about um, ways to go forward. So Robert, let me turn things over to you and have you share with us some slides from your polling data. Thank you so much, Bill, and thank you so much, Alec, for having me. We really appreciate it. And you're right, Senator Rucker, this is a conversation about whether you shore up or look at different opportunities. And what we have been doing at Ed Choice is to find out what parents are actually thinking about and how they're seeing this and perceiving this. So we've been doing polling since April 21st, and we've been doing it on a regular basis ever since. And so let me share with you some of the data about how what parents, what we've learned about parents, what they learned about this situation, how they feel, and what the data says about going forward. And I'll try to go through this quickly. So in many ways, the question is, how are parents feeling right now? Uh, this is based on our ongoing polling that we've been doing, as I said, since April 21st. So it's, it's a no-brainer when, when you're asked, when we ask parents, think about the coronavirus right now, how concerned are you about each of the following issues? What's obvious, and we all know this, is that parents are dramatically concerned of their children getting exposed to this virus at school. So almost half of them say they're very concerned, and another 30% said they're somewhat concerned. That's 70%, 79%. That's huge. The second most interesting thing is that the, uh, they're concerned about their child losing instruction time. They're, they're not as concerned about after-school programs. They're not as concerned about their work. They're really concerned about, is my child going to be safe? And um, is my child going to lose instruction time? And so these are uh, the main concerns of parents right now. Uh, we know, however, and this is, this is interesting because our data is a little bit different from others, but the data that we've gotten from parents on a regular basis, showing that parents are actually fairly feeling positive, feeling very positive about uh, their ability to facilitate instruction. So 37% of parents said they were very prepared as opposed to 27% of teachers. And 37% uh, said they were somewhat prepared as opposed to 48%. So roughly equal on the, the somewhat or very, but the fact is, is families are feeling more prepared and more capable uh, than we thought. So when we talk about parents right away, we're talking about parents that are concerned about their child's safety, concerned about their instruction, feeling like they're capable to handle what is being thrown at them, although not perfectly. And of course, there are many uh, issues uh, with that. Um, then we also know, based on data that we've gotten, this is from uh, the Harvard uh, School, that parents of charter school students, or parents of charter schools and parents of private schools were much more satisfied with their school sector than the district sector. And this is true across the board, uh, whether, it's a, whether it's a different income quartile or, or, or ethnicity. The reality is, is that both the charter and the private sector responded very well to parents' needs uh, and were able to, to get them what they wanted. In fact, our polling of private school leaders found that uh, when they started in March 13th, uh, probably less than 20% had online instruction. And within a month and a half, fully 85% had online instruction. So private schools were responding very rapidly. Hey, so that's Robert, Robert, if I can interrupt just a second and ask you to click share screen for your slides. Oh, have I not done that? I I'm sitting there going, I'm sitting there thought I was share screen. I'm so sorry. I'm just talking at everyone and not sharing my screen. Sorry. That's great information, but if we can see it visually, it'll be all the better. After I did all that to try and do it, I'm sorry there. All right, so just so everyone knows, this is, uh, everyone should be able to see it. That's the this is the, the screen on showing parents' concerns from our polling. This is the screen on them feeling satisfied and prepared, sorry, prepared. And this is the screen on satisfaction. We'll share this with everyone, uh, I, I believe, as well. I mean, so then the question is, what does the future hold? Um, and what do they say? Well, here's what the future's holding right now for a lot of parents is chaos, right? It's, 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 and what we know of school reopened today is what we're hearing from the Gallup poll. Uh, polls are showing that a surprising number of students won't send their kids back to school. Roughly a quarter are saying that. 
Um, they all know that there's going to be some online uh, schooling necessary. And if you look at our polling, which is on the right, based on what you know right now, do you expect your children will be able to return to school in August, September? Uh, and based on what you know on the right hand side, it says, how comfortable would you feel? So there's a lot of concern about whether families want to go back to school in the same way. There's a lot of concern with the comfort uh, levels. And so there's a lot of chaos out there. So there's, we also know that um, based on, based on uh, if your school or district allowed the option of e-learning, would you do that? 35% said very likely and 34% said somewhat likely. So it's really interesting data on what parents are wanting right now, which I think leads you to the whole conversation about opportunity and I'll get through this quickly. So in all of this chaos comes opportunity, right? And so, first of all, it's really important to know people as a result of this pandemic have a significantly higher favorability towards homeschooling. So if you look at white school parents, it's 43% it's, uh, more likely, more favorable. If you look at Hispanics, it's 43%, it's, uh, no, it's uh, 30, 39, 45%, I think 35%. But what's super interesting is, is African-American parents. 53% have a more favorable opinion of, of homeschooling. It's a super interesting, empowering structure that families are beginning to feel. So what does that lead you to in the opportunities, right? Leads you to the new definition of schooling, right? And the new, a new way forward, right? Bottom up parent centered ideas, which is what Freddie's all about, right? Uh, our next panelists. You're gonna see the expansion of micro schools like what's happening in Arizona with Arizona Empowered Families. I love their, their, their uh, name, it's basically Empowered AF. Uh, there's family pod schooling, which you're hearing a lot about, and this is gonna grow and grow and grow. And essentially what's happening is uh, the, the education equivalent of Hurricane Katrina's Cajun Navy. Basically, you're seeing civil society starting to ride up, rise up and say, we can do it for ourselves. You've got the new Native American ESA idea. You've got the South Carolina and Oklahoma governors using gear funds for, for private schools more hybrid homeschooling. And of course, as we all know, yesterday, Senator Alexander and Senator Scott launched the School Choice Act Now Act, which is a federal effort to, to be, be able to allow uh, money to flow to scholarship groups in states uh, to give out scholarships and, uh, and ESA, basically, uh, uh, money to families. So what's happening is this incredible bottom up uh, from parents. It's a new way to frame uh, this, the, the, the education delivery mechanism, not saying public schools aren't part of it. Of course, they're a huge part of it. But what now is gonna happen is it has to be much more about parent-centric. So that's the data as we have it right now. That's Thanks. excellent, Robert. And um, I really love the Cajun Navy analogy. I mean, that's a perfect way of describing the way that a lot of parents are responding to uh, the chaos and the initiative that we're seeing on the part of people who are rallying their friends and neighbors and others to uh, form collectives that are um, addressing some of these problems on their own and taking responsibility themselves rather than um, relying on um, uh, school officials to be able to somehow thread the needle and satisfy everyone. And I guess that leads me to one quick question for you before we um, uh, turn to Freddie, and that is this. Um, doesn't all of the chaos that we're seeing now and the divergent opinion that you um, pinpointed in your survey, doesn't all of that suggest that going about things in a one-size-fits-all way is, is never going to get us where we want and is, the, in some respects, the worst thing that public officials can attempt to do? Because it seems to me, as I listen to parents just on an um, informal level, um, I hear some who say, I just don't feel comfortable sending my kid back. Um, we have health related concerns and we just don't wanna do that. We don't feel safe. And I hear other parents saying, hey, uh, it's, life is um, full of risks. Th these are relatively small, no problem. Let's get the schools open as quickly as possible. And it seems to me that there's no way that public policymakers can, with a single policy, satisfy both of those groups. And yet they each have, it seems to me, very legitimate concerns. Am I missing something or is it's, this not a perfect illustration of why one size fits all just doesn't work? It, it is the perfect illustration of why one size fits all doesn't work. And 
um, it's very interesting that every district is doing it differently, right? So you have school districts in my area, one that is entirely closed, one that's opening 14 days late, one that's offering a mixture of online or hybrid, one that's saying you can, you've got to choose one or the other. What's interesting is they were, they're doing everything very differently. And I think uh, once this genie is out of the bottle, I don't think parents are going to let it put, be put back in. In fact, there's this really interesting group in Austin right now called, I think it's Stronger Together ATX, which is basically trying to ensure when, as pods get developed, low-income kids have access to them. And so they're trying to match low-income families to pods. And this is what's happening, right? What's happening is, is this sort of Cajun native education reform is coming out and, and saying we're not going to have a one-size-fits-all system anymore. And so districts have to respond to that, or they're just going to try and uh, close and say, well, we'll just do it all online. Well, we know how that's working out for families. It's not, right? So I think what this private sector and this civil society are doing is really lifting up the opportunities and the money is starting to flow towards families. All right, I wanna come back in just a few minutes and ask some additional questions of both you and Senator Rucker, um, because we're gonna uh, kind of have a free for all that uh, allows everyone to um, join back in the conversation. We're gonna turn it just a second to uh, Freddie, but I do wanna ask this uh, question real quickly of Robert, and that is you made reference to pods um, explain what you mean by pods in case people are unfamiliar with that term. Obviously, uh, if, you, if you're not familiar with pods, you just go to look at the New York Times, Washington Post, and USA Today in the last week, which is they're finally recognizing what's happening. Uh, I've had over a dozen conversations in the last week alone from people calling me and saying, you know what, I don't feel comfortable sending my kid back to school. So five of us are trying to get together and think of how much we could get to our teacher to come to our house. Do you know any teachers out there? So we're getting a lot of conversations about um, basically groups of families coming together and say, and this has been in the homeschooling industry forever, right? This is sort of a homeschooling co-ops, right? But this is more family centric, right? So, or neighborhood centric even, right? So families in the same neighborhood are saying, hey, we all know each other, our kids play together and we're not, we're not worried about illness because we know each other, we're together. So let's go hire some teachers and do it in our house. And it's, this is the concept that's going on. And obviously the concern from, from some is that it won't be equitable access. But this is why I think, again, civil society is rising up and what's happening in Austin is happening where you're saying, hey, I can, I can connect teachers with low-income families. And, and that's, a, that's a great idea. So pods are basically, Bill, families or groups of people coming together, you know, between five and 10, like a Prenda micro school, right? It's sort of, and what's interesting about all this is all the terminology is changing now. Right? Is it a micro school? Is it a, is a micro school, a public school, a private school, a charter school, a home school? The terminology is just gone. And so, which is really good because the whole fight for so long, as you know, has been it's public versus private. Don't take public dollars from public schools. Don't give it to private religious schools. So as this changes to sort of parent-based language, which is, I don't care what type it is. I just want to get my kid in the, the setting that works for them. I think this is the right, this is the, what's happening here. Very good. I think you're right. There is a lot of uh, interest in the media all of a sudden in this pod concept. And I think what it suggests is that many of the most influential voices in education policy at this at the local level, at the school level, the, the people that I think of as PTA moms are discovering that this is the way to go um, and are taking the initiative to do this. And they're getting the attention of um, media people and others who say, hey, here's something new and different. And it is new and different in some respects, but as we're about to see, there are people like Freddie Wood that were um, cool, homeschooling cool before, uh, and, and pod cool before the rest of the uh, world discovered it. It's my pleasure to introduce next um, uh, Freddie Wood. Freddie and her husband, Robert, live in Orlando. And had our ALEC conference been held in person, you would have had the opportunity to meet them and their five children who are just an absolute delight. Um, Freddie and her uh, husband have been at this for a number of years and have a really interesting story. And in just a minute, I'm gonna ask them about some of the different models that they have adopted over time. But what I wanna do first is to show a short uh, four minute video that will give you um, a, a better context, I think, for the questions that we'll be asking of Freddie. So without further ado, we're going to roll that video and uh, then we'll turn to uh, Freddie for some questions.
I'm I'm not getting sound on this. So we are not getting sound on this. We're going to um, let our tech crew give it another try. Here we go. And So I'm continuing to see problems with this. And what we may do is uh, halt things here and then come back to this a little bit later. Um, but what I'd like to do now is just to pull Freddie herself in and um, have her kind of give us a little bit of uh, history. Um, you guys started out, as I recall, with uh, um, saying, hey, um, we don't really have any experience doing homeschooling, but we want to be the primary influence in our children's lives. Um, how can we go about doing that? And you discovered a school, as I recall, that um, kind of put the lessons together for you and had you implement them several days a week. How about telling us a little bit more about that, if you would? Sure. Uh, hi, Bill, and thanks to Alec for inviting me to be a part of this panel. I really appreciate that opportunity to just share our story. Um, yeah, we, you know, our philosophy as far as education goes was always that parents are the primary teachers of their kids. And so we, you know, we can choose whether we want to partner with other families like Robert was talking about or you know, partner with a school. And so we always felt like we should have that choice. It shouldn't be forced upon us to enter into any particular avenue of, of education. So um, yeah, from the very beginning, um, we've always been a part of a school of some sort where, like you said, sometimes they would give you the lessons for the four days a week at home and then you'd go into an actual classroom setting for one day a week. Um, we've done co-ops where it's parent-led, uh, where it's more informal and, you know, the parents are really the ones that are teaching and just joining together. And if you have a particular expertise, then you teach a class on that subject. So we've done that. Um, we've also been a part of schools that are accredited that, um, you know, as, especially as our kids got older, like RJ and Trinity are, you know, basically now in college and a soon to be senior. And so as they get older, then we wanted that accreditation. We wanted those transcript, you know, services and guidance counselors and those types of, of services that they were able to provide, dual enrollment classes and opportunities. So we chose a school that would provide that, especially for the older children. So there's so much opportunity, so much choice out there. And um, I'm glad that, honestly, I'm just glad that people are waking up to that, that parents are waking up to take control of the education of their kids. And one of the things that has always really impressed me about your uh, family's story is just how um, different in, in some respects, especially when it comes to kind of interest and aptitude, some of your kids are. And you have found schools that were able to kind of cultivate those interests in interesting ways or programs, not necessarily even schools, that uh, you've been able to enroll your kids in that gave them opportunities to explore their interests I know in RJ's case in aviation and in robotics and in Trinity's case in theater. Talk a little bit more about how you discovered that and how exactly that fit into your larger family's approach to um, education. Well, yeah, I think, you know, I think it's interesting that we've kind of developed this model of education where you can only learn by sitting in the classroom behind a desk, right? When, you know, when I read our forefathers and, and you know, people back in those times that were majority homeschooled and I, you know, their, their writings are so, you know, they're obviously they're educated people <laughs> and they weren't necessarily in that setting. So, you know, we really enjoyed, I got to say, the, 
non-classroom learning opportunities that we've been able to give our kids and also learn along with them. You know, that's, that's been a fun part for our family, just being able to go to museums and go to science centers. I mean, I don't know if you remember, that's where I met you eight years ago <laughs> at a constitution day at the science center, right? So those kinds of opportunities where you can go and learn as a family, you know, and, and give your kids hands-on learning opportunities has just been really a, a vital part of uh, uh, their education. And it also gives us flexibility and just the time for them to explore interests, their own, develop their passions, you know, otherwise I don't know if we would have that amount of time to have them explore those things. So it's, it's been a blessing. Yeah, I should tell folks that, yes, we met at this uh, program that uh, my organization, James, the James Madison Institute, put on on Constitution Day. And we decided, we had a lecturer coming that evening to speak to a, a mostly adult audience. We decided to do a, a, a quiz game in the late afternoon for any students in the area that might want to come out and have a Ben Franklin reenactor um, quiz students on their knowledge of US history and civics. And lo and behold, RJ shows up, along with Trinity, who was then really young. And boy, I mean, question after question, every, I mean, you couldn't get, he couldn't get a question by those kids because they knew it all. And it was really impressive. And out of that, of course, grew a friendship and we continue to keep tabs on your family and the uh, progression of your kids and are um, really excited to see them now moving into college and all the rest. You made reference in that to um, the fact that you enjoy learning um, in settings other than the, the classroom and in uh, uh, something other than traditional ways. And I, I wanna turn now back to Senator Rucker, because I know that in your state in West Virginia, you guys have adopted a program called Learn Everywhere. And I think it would be something that uh, um, le legislators in other states would be interested in learning more about. So tell us about Le Learn Everywhere um, in West Well, thank you so much for letting me talk a little bit about that. That was a bill that did get passed this past year. And the idea behind it was that you there is a lot of education that occurs outside of the classroom. Um, folks know that working, you know, people try to do apprenticeships and internships because there is a lot of education that can happen in the workplace and getting, you can get credit for that. It definitely helps you later on if you want to go into a career. But beyond that, like Freddie was mentioning, and um, her experiences sound a lot like what my homeschooling experience has been with my five kids, you know, getting the kids to actually go out there to a wildlife refuge and volunteer and learning to take care of uh, wildlife that has been injured and learning what they need. That is an education. That is an education that goes beyond the classroom and reading a biology book. Absolutely, you should be able to get credit for that. And there's you know, more opportunities that I could possibly mention, but that legislation is, the thinking behind it is, let's challenge the you know, education community, the establishment, the state board, the education, whatever controls your education in your state, to come up with a way that folks who are doing these educational opportunities beyond the classroom can get credit for it, that it could count so that nothing is wasted. Right, and it also encourages innovation in education. It encourages uh, pursuit of things that you can't possibly fit into a classroom behind a desk. Yeah, one of the things that's really interesting to me about this whole idea is that within any community are any number of people who have expertise in a particular subject, but have no interest in starting a. Um, a, a, a full-fledged school that provides courses in every um, conceivable subject from A to Z. You know, here in our city, I live in Tallahassee, the capital of Florida, and we have, you know, a museum for Florida history, which is a great resource for kids to learn about Florida history, or uh, have a, um, a, a, a large synagogue that has Hebrew classes that one can go and learn a foreign language. They're not going to go into the business, the museum nor the synagogue are going to go into the business of providing schooling all day, every day for kids in the traditional sense. But they do provide educational services and oftentimes have expertise that exceeds that, that you'd find in the classroom. And so I think your concept of giving kids opportunities to take advantage of those sorts of resources 
and to benefit from them in the credentialing process makes an awful lot of sense. I'm curious to know in your state, you had a group, I mean, you yourself are part of a homeschooling community. We're homeschooling prior to the pandemic. But then all of a sudden, all these kids started coming and learning from home for the first time because their schools were shut down. And many are now planning to stay there. Give me a sense of how the um, pre-pandemic homeschooling community, if you will, views this influx of new homeschoolers. Is, is this something that they are welcoming and encouraged about? something that they view as a potential threat or give us a sense of kind of how they're responding and what their attitudes are to some of these changes? Well, there, I will tell you that there has been a huge, you know, new uh, homeschoolers that joined us. A lot of the, uh, originally when the schools were first shut down and people were forced to school from home, um, there was a, a little bit of a push to define, you know, you're not really a homeschooler if you're doing online learning and still doing everything the public school is telling you to do um, versus homeschooling where, you know, the parent is the one that's doing the education and, and um, basically organizing what the child is learning. But in terms of the reaction and how it has you know, move through the few months that have transgressed. I have to tell you that homeschoolers are welcoming with open arms those who truly want to try homeschooling, those who have decided to stay in homeschooling for their children. One of the interesting things that occurred, a lot of parents and a lot of families who would never have considered homeschooling before, when their kids were forced to be at home and they had to take over the watching of their kids to do their schooling, they realized several things. There are those families that did not like what their kids were learning and what the kids were doing um, and have made them question whether or not they want to send their kids back to the public school. And there are parents who realize, you know, this isn't such a bad thing. Like Freddie mentioned, they realize the benefits of having the flexibility, um, how much fun it is to work with your kids and learn together, um, all the enriching things you can add to what you're learning. Um, and it has, um, created, I, th I think there's going to be uh, definitely a growth in homeschooling. I think uh, I have heard from many constituents who have decided that they will continue homeschooling um, this fall. And of course, the homeschooling community that has existed is lending them a hand and, and giving them encouragement. There are several Facebook posts that have just exploded in membership that are homeschool related. Um, and then there's also the other reaction. There are definite parents who did not like the experience and who have reached out to me and said, oh, I can't wait for public school to start. And I have a new appreciation for what the teachers are doing and all of that. It's not you know, all encompassing. But um, both reactions are valid. And as you, the point you were making and, and Robert was making, having that choice is essential. You know, Bill, it's interesting. It's interesting, Bill, that, that the, the homeschoolers were trying to sort of discuss what kind of homeschooling it was after the pandemic and then sort of rethought that, at which I thought was a great step because the reality is, is, you know, that was their recognition that we're not just going to segment ourselves, right? We're going to start thinking about this differently. We're going to start thinking about it from a parent-based centric, at least that's my experience with the homeschooling community so far. Um, and so, you know, what, whatever we're gonna call this, this education from going forward, whether it's, you know, homeschooling, hybrid homeschooling, whatever it is, it's, it's really gonna be different. And there are gonna be a lot more people doing it than just going to traditional brick and mortar. And you may see in the hybrid case where, you know, they're going part-time to the brick and mortar and then part-time to the, to the other school and then part-time going to themselves. I could certainly see a lot more of that. So I, one of the things that I was uh, kind of amused by uh, Senator Rucker's comments was just your earlier point about we're in a completely new space when it comes to the appropriate language and, and lexicon for what we call things because there are certain, you know, categories that d no longer um, fit or define exactly. We need to now separate one group from another. And one of the things that struck me too from Senator Rucker's comments is that I know a lot of the pre-pandemic homeschoolers have very um, strong and I think legitimate concerns about 
um, government intrusion and interference in what they're doing and kind of take what is the K-12 equivalent of the um, view that say Hillsdale College takes of saying we don't want to take government funds lest strings be attached. There is now a growing number of people who are open to and interested in uh, learning at home or learning everywhere um, who may not necessarily share that view or would at least say, I need to have some access to the per pupil resources that um, were previously following my child to the public school so that I can make this happen. And one of the things that I think the larger school choice movement is going to need to um, do is to help encourage all of these different parties to work together to make certain that no one's interests are sacrificed because I want to preserve the ability for people who want to go in a certain sense off the grid and say, we don't want any money, but we want as little regulation as possible, while at the same time making it possible for new families who want to um, take advantage of homeschooling or other opportunities like it to say, yeah, um, I'm going to do that, but I need some help. I need some of that tax money that I've been sending you back so that I can make this work financially. Robert, yes. um, can I just say something real quick? Yeah, please. yeah, that that's one of the challenges us legislators are going to be facing. I will tell you that there's already some call for greater regulation of these increased numbers of homeschoolers to make certain that they're doing it right. And that's something that we have to um, really watch out for because uh, the vast majority of homeschooling, the evidence is out there, they're doing a great job. They're not having problems getting their kids into colleges. They're not having ha problems having their kids, you know, go into the workforce. So this push for greater regulation, you know, just watch out for it and be ready for that. Um, but you're absolutely right. We, I want to have options open and, um, and the, the ability to be able to help those who want to give their kids an education at home but need help in certain subjects or in certain areas or want to have access to athletic sports and they don't have it outside of public school you know those type of things are things we have to i think work to provide for them thank you yeah and I, think, Robert, I want to return to a question for you that um was part of the presentation you did earlier. We've talked some about homeschooling, about hybrid schooling, about these new pods and other things that are emerging, but we've had for a long time um, charter schools, private schools that have provided alternatives to those um, looking for something other than the district school. And one of the things that I noticed right as soon as the pandemic hit that came out of your organization, as you said, folks, uh, you know, keep an eye out for the local private school in your area because in economic downturns in the past, we have seen many of these schools suffer because their parents getting no scholarship assistance, no return on their tax dollars, find themselves now often in a, in a position where they can no longer afford tuition and schools have even closed. And so I'm curious to know from you, what is the state of private schooling um, currently how have private schools been affected? Do you see some of those adverse effects that you feared might happen? Um, and do you see any solutions or, or ways to prevent um, serious damage being done to the private school community? So thanks, Bill. And I think that in some ways that's a little too early to tell, uh, but here's what we do know, right? You have 40 million families who are now unemployed. Right? Many of those families were, were low and middle income families that were, were willing to struggle and pay uh, private school tuition to Catholic schools. Um, and so that is going to be farther outside of their reach nowadays. So we know that in the last recession uh, in 2008, you saw a significant reduction in the number of private school kids as a result of income issues. So we expect that to happen now. And, and already we know of at least 107 private schools around the country that are closing. Uh, and maybe more. Um, so that's the one thing, there's a lot of concern. I mean, think about the, the religious school sector. Uh, you can't go to church, and so you're not getting any support from the community for your school, and so there's a huge issue related to keeping particularly religious Catholic schools open, right? So we know that's out there. On the other hand, right, what we're seeing, like in a state like Indiana, um, guess which schools are opening this fall on time with solid plans ready to go? Right. And these are your private schools. Right. So in Indiana, 
our private schools are way ahead of the curve in terms of being able to open up and open up safely and think it through. Um, now that may change, of course, you know, you never know what's going to happen with this pandemic, but right now it's the longer this has gone on, the more some of those families, Senator Director, that you mentioned that say, hey, I want to go back to a school, are going to say, I want to go back to a school, but not necessarily a traditional school because they're not going to be open. And so it's going to be, it, I, I think we're a little early to see what, what the whole impact is, but I, and we know we've seen some closures, but we also know that private sector is responding pretty doggone fast. Yeah, it's interesting um, when you talk about the way in which the private school community in your state is, um, you know, opening back up and, and whatnot. One of the things that strikes me, you know, the, as you mentioned earlier, the federal government is currently considering a package of in excess of a million, a uh, hundred billion dollars to try to help schools in this transition this fall in the unique situation that they find themselves in. And I've I've wondered, and I'd be curious to know your thought on this, but you know, if, if they were just to send that money instead of routing it back to the schools and uh, um, asking them to do something with it, if they, if they were just to send that money back to the parents, to the taxpayers and say, we will let you determine what works best for you and your family this fall in light of this, I have a feeling that a lot of those private schools that are opening in response to market demand would be joined by many others to respond to market demands. And we would see a completely different landscape here um, and response to this rather than schools all wanting to shut down and to remain closed. Am I, am I wrong in that assumption or? No, I think, I think you're right. And I want to go back to the court conversation you made uh, with Senator Rucker about you know, homeschooling and the fear of regulation a little bit when we discuss this. So think of, think of learning and schooling as a spectrum. On one hand, you have a parent-controlled, parent-led, at-home, no public money, right? That, and one could, one could argue that could be an ideal, right? On the, on the other end of that spectrum, you have a large government-run building with government-run institutions and state-run funding, and it's all based on property tax, right? So those are the two sort of things. But what we're learning is the whole conversation happens between those spectrums now. And so as families, as what you're going to see is, is as long as the money goes to the family, whether through a third party or directly, right, that, that, that creates more towards the homeschooling side of the sector. And that's the kind of thing we want to see. We want to see uh, funds going directly to families to control them uh, because it's their funds to control in the first place, right? And so, so I think that the key here is, is can you get the money to be to the parents' hand, parent-centric? Can you make it as directed by the state as possible? If you can do anything federally, it's got to be directed by the state because it's the primary duty of the state to provide education, not the federal government. And then three, can you do it making sure there's very little regulation? And I think the more you give funds directly to families, the harder it is to regulate them. Yeah, I'm really glad that you laid out that spectrum in the way that you did, because I've often wondered if not only would, would it be ideal for us to get more toward the kind of homeschooling end of the, uh, of the spectrum when it comes to funding and, and basically putting resources in the hands of parents to give them the opportunity to direct things. But that from a regulation standpoint, that would also be in some ways the, the ideal default is to say, okay, we're going to trust parents. We're going to um, start from this um, kind of pure example and then determine what sort of regulation is necessary um, building on that rather than starting from the highly regulated, state-directed, state-controlled public school paradigm and then working down from that. And I think we would end up with a much better regulatory um, situation when it comes to schooling if we started more at the homeschooling end of the spectrum and worked up rather than starting from the public school um, end of the spectrum and working down. Um, I want to pull uh, Freddie back into the conversation and, and ask her to invite uh, RJ and um, uh, Trinity to join her if they would. And uh, let me just remind you while she's getting them to um, uh, use your question function or your chat function to submit questions to us that I can then ask of the panelists in the remaining minutes that we have left. So, um, Wood family. Uh, RJ, how about giving us an update on where things stand uh, for you? I remember when we did the video several years ago, um, you were learning how to fly a plane before you even learned how to drive a car. 
Yeah. So yeah. Tell, us, tell us about where you are now. And Trinity, as I recall back then, you were uh, performing on a regular basis with the mm -hmm. Orlando uh, Theater Company or something. So give us each, um, each of you, take a minute to kind of update us on where you are and how your schooling has led you to the place that you find yourself. All right, cool. So starting with me, uh, sure. now uh, I am now at Embry-Riddle, which is really cool. It's an aeronautical university where I am studying aerospace engineering. So pretty much the whole homeschooling um, for me, how that's impacted uh, me going to college is because I was able to um, my mom was able to kind of refine my schooling to how I could be able to excel and to focus on things that I want to do. And if you remember back then, while I was able to learn how to fly was because I was, um, I had time to be able to do that in between school because my mom couldn't kind of modify, you know, um, my schooling around um, flying in the mornings, which you couldn't really do if you're at public school and stuff like that. Yeah, aeronautics is not a course that I find at most schools <laughs> that I uh, go to. And yet it was, uh, along with robotics, uh, I remember that you were a part of um, a robotics competition group that won a bunch of competitions and yeah. traveled around competing with other youth groups that were uh, teams of young students that were uh, building robots and whatnot, and 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 Freddie, your mom, your mom tells me that uh, your uh, middle sister, uh, Samira, did a little uh, robotics, but didn't quite take to it as much as you did. Huh? No, 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 not as much as me. But yeah, <laughs> she tried it. She did. She tried it. She tried it, and she liked it in a way. <laughs> But well, yeah. that's one of the beauties is of this is that you're flexible. You can try things. Sometimes they stick. Sometimes they don't. Mm -hmm. So Trinity, tell us about your um, budding career as an <laughs> actress. We've well, seen so stage I'm, I'm going into my 12th year of high school. Or not 12th year. That's 12, sorry, that's a long time. time. <laughs> I'm going into 12th grade. There we go. <laughs> uh, I'm a senior this year. Um, I've been doing theater with Circle Theater Company. Um, for four years now. This is my fourth year. There we go. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I've been getting ready for college. So uh, getting ready to audition and apply for colleges and stuff like that. Um, and again, just like he said, being flexible. Uh, I've been able to be a part of a wonderful theater program inside the school that I'm going to academically. And so that's just been a blessing and I've loved every part of it. So yeah, it's been a good the time. The thing is that they offer, like she'll get an arts honors diploma because she spent so much time, like all day Wednesdays are all arts. Mm -hmm. That's all she does on Wednesdays, all day. So because they have the ability to, to create this, you know, it's like a pre-professional program. She basically will walk out of high school with, you know, a diploma that says, hey, I've achieved a certain level of training in, in the arts. So yeah. that's pretty cool. Yeah. No, that's outstanding. Well, we are delighted that you guys are progressing and not at all surprised that you're continuing, continuing along the path that um, you were on when we last visited with you, um, because it was clear then that these interests in the arts or, the, or in the science, uh, aviation, were things that um, weren't just passing fads. So I'm glad to see that you're able to pursue that and that you're um, continuing to build on um, the opportunities that you've been given. I want to turn back now to um, uh, Senator Rucker, to Robert, and to ask um, this question, which is, um, if, if you could give policymakers one word of advice, uh, there's a lot going on, a lot of questions out there, but if, if you could say, whatever else you do, do this one thing now, what would that be? And then I've got a follow-up question um, uh, to come back to uh, from that, from there. But what would, what one thing should we do now if we don't do anything else? Well, I, I guess I'll start off by um, saying that the one thing right now you should do, if you do not um, have the knowledge or the comfort level of what educational choice opportunities are out there, get yourself educated. And companies and websites like EdChoice are perfect places to start. Um, there's tons of information out there, 
but get yourself to a comfort level of being able to know and understand what the different choices and possibilities are. And I will say, Alec has a lot of model legislation if you're wanting to see what's out there, what's been passed by other states. Great. Terrific, Senator. And I would only, of course, Bill, you know me, I can't just do one thing. It has to be two <laughs> things, right? Um, the first thing is, is a broad thing. Legislators and policymakers should doggedly be parent-centered now. Ask your, every legislator should always ask, what's in Freddie's children's best interest? What works best for them, right? And that's not going to be a one-size-fits-all system, which is gonna then make policymakers have to think and listen differently to the lobbyists in the building, right? And how, the, and how that works. So number one, really change the view of which side of the spectrum you're going to listen to first, right? And then the second thing is, just start driving dollars to families, right? It's really not that hard. You can do it in any way you can, right? So I know I, I know in Missouri, it might be more challenging, but there's lots of different ways you can do it, whether through the, the, the gear funds at the governor's level or whether it's through uh, ESAs or whether it's through scholarship tax credits or whether it's through learn everywhere in the public sector, right? Or whether it's through allowing public schools to be a lot more free. So you know, there's just a lot more clear ways that legislators can drive dollars to families and have them in control. By the way, and that will be probably one of the most just things we can do in our society besides get rid of all the systemic problems we have. Very good, yes. So a, a question that has come in from one of um, our viewers who happens to be a fellow member of the ALEC Education Task Force, Mark Danielson, and he comments, he says, I've spoken to a handful of parents who were forced to uh, to do school at home this spring, and they commented that in a one-on-one -on -one environment, um, children were often able to accomplish a, a quote-unquote full day's work in only a few hours, and that this left a lot more time for enriching and creative activities beyond the school um, uh, requirements. And I'm curious to know from Freddie and you and the, and the kids, has that been your experience, that you're able to get a lot more done in a lot less time than would happen in a, in a traditional school by going about things in the way that you've done it. Absolutely. And, you know, I think that that kind of encapsules, you know, the difference between schooling at home or in a hybrid situation or, you know, the various uh, opportunities that are there is because you can focus in on the things that the kids are interested in and allow them to, you know, if, Trinity's not going to be a mathematician, <laughs> you know, because she doesn't love math, then having her sit there for hours upon hours upon hours doing math, you know, is, is not really benefiting her any, and it's just dragging down her love of learning, right? So if I can have her do her one hour, okay, come on, Trent, if you do this <laughs> one hour math, right, I can, I can get you to your voice lesson, or I can, you know, we can go do, you know, go visit a museum or whatever it is, but it just allows them, I think, just more flexibility and time to be able to actually develop a love for learning mm -hmm. and not just doing something because I have to. Well, let me follow up on that because one of the things that I remember being true of um, Trinity when we last uh, visited with you guys is that you were talking about history and um, Trinity's love of stories and storytelling and how you found a history curriculum that kind of, so talk a little bit about that if you would. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, very opposite, <laughs> opposite minds, <Yeah. laughs> you know, logical, mm -hmm. nonfiction, loves nonfiction, loves that type of thing. Trinity, not so much. She's more artistic. And so, you know, when we were looking for an art um, history curriculum, I came across this, also, I can't remember the name of it now, but I still have it, but <laughs> um, came across this great curriculum that basically tells history, American history through stories. And that was still, I think, one of her favorite years of history was when we were able to really, you know, put that link between her love of storytelling and history and combine those two and allow her to experience that. I would have not ha had that option if she was in the public school system and if I wasn't directly monitoring and, you know, providing what's best for her, her learning style. So. So you're not only able to kind of feed the interests of the child and, and cater to their love of the arts or their love of science in different cases, but even in those necessary subjects that they must do, you're able to find a curriculum that 
is tailored to their particular bent and that is likely to bring that subject to life for them in a way that may not happen in a, in a setting where there's lots of kids and, and, the, and the school has to kind of cater to the average uh, rather than to the particular. So I think it's, you know, we've, we've asked too much of our public school system. There's no way they can do that. So again, like I started with, it's parents' responsibility to educate their kids. And we can partner with whoever we choose to. If you choose to partner with the public school, private school, whatever it may be, but it still comes down to us knowing our kids and providing the best education we can for them. And, and Bill, this, yeah, that's please. fantastic to hear. Uh, people don't remember that this whole delivery mechanism of how many hours, how many subjects, um, 12 subjects, 12 years with this was, was uh, and I'm gonna share a quick picture, was put together by these guys. Let's see if I can share this real quick. It was called the Committee of 10. Hmm. And just look at the, those are the guys who decided how public schooling should be organized on a daily basis uh, in the 1890s. And so that's actually what we, 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 we're we still living with, right? Is that kind of legacy of 10 guys from who are in the know saying, hey, this is the how many hours we need to do it. That's how hours came up, seat time came up, uh, courses came up. And, and, and that's what created this sort of monolith that, that parents don't always feel served by. And I heard uh, in response to Bartley's question, I couldn't agree more. I don't know how many parents have said to me, what did my kid do for five out of seven hours a day at school? What the heck was going on? Because they're, they're only doing two hours of some kind of work, right? What's, so what's going on for the other time? So I think this whole pandemic, you know, uh, is really changing the nature of how parents are responding. So we've got only two minutes left and I want to throw it open for, for anyone to make a closing comment or observation on anything that you've heard uh, to this point. I guess maybe, maybe, maybe the question would be this. We've talked a lot about what legislators can do right now to address things. Let's look ahead to the spring, to the spring when legislatures will be back in session and where some of this immediate crisis will have passed at least a little bit, we'll have more information to draw on. What should legislators be thinking about for next spring um, in, in taking the lessons from this pandemic and making certain that we go forward in a direction that's better for families? Anybody have thoughts on that? Senator? <laughs> if, what, what's going to happen in West Virginia, for example, in the spring, you think? Well, um, so this is an election year. Uh, I hate to say it and bring politics into it, but we will see who wins their elections and who stays in the majority in the West Virginia legislature. I can tell you that the West Virginia Senate has definitely shown that it strongly supports school choice. It tried and failed to pass educational savings account, but um, I feel that that's strongly an option that we need to pursue in West Virginia because we do have a lot of families that don't have the resources to be able to homeschool, private school, unless we give them some help with it. I also feel very strongly, sorry, <laughs> I also feel very strongly that um, we have to pursue um, ways to strengthen the current delivery systems. Our broadband is a big issue, and I think that that's going to become uh, probably one of the number one priorities. Very good. Well, we are now out of time. I do want to refer all of you to our website at jamesmadison.org so that you can see the entire Wood family video that we um, have available there. That's jamesmadison.org, and you can um, learn more about the story of the Wood family and how they've approached education. I want to also make one closing observation, and that's this, that it seems to me, if nothing else, this entire episode has um, emphasized just how important to parents the safety of their children is. And while we have historically made the argument for school choice on academic grounds and ought to continue to do so, because as we've discussed today, there are many good uh, academic reasons for wanting to give kids uh, a wider variety of choices. Um, one of the things that comes out consistently in the polling data, we saw it again this morning with uh, Robert's data, is that 
her, that the safety of their children is often paramount in the minds of uh, parents. And uh, in Florida, we have adopted something called the Hope Scholarship, which Alec has now turned into a model bill called the Student Safety Scholarship. And basically what it says is, if parents have safety related concerns about their, the education of their children, we want to give them opportunities to go elsewhere so that they can attend a school where they feel safe or have a, a, a learning opportunity or experience that they um, consider safe. So remember that, look and consider adopting that in your state, but um, let's continue to make the argument, not just on academic grounds, but also on safety related grounds for school choice. Thank you again for your time and attention. Thank you to all of our panelists. I really appreciate your wisdom and insight. It's been a great um, panel and uh, I, I think, um, will uh, uh, benefit from this going forward within the ALEC Education Task Force community. Thank, yes, you. thank you so much. Thank you to our speakers um, and for everyone attending today. Uh, this was the final workshop of the 47th ALEC annual meetings. Thank you for everyone who attended and participated in any way. Uh, thanks again and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Wood family. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Trinity, if you come to Tallahassee for college, you've got a home away from home at the Madison. <laughs> Thank you. We will be visiting Florida State. I'll yes. let you know when we visit. <laughs> I know people at the FAMU Theater and School as well. So either way, we'll we'll if we, if we can have Trinity in town, we'll be very happy campers. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate you. Thank you. See you. Bye bye. Bye. bye.